Welcome to the first edition of the World Sailing Show. A new close-up monthly view of the racing world. Be it a blistering non-stop drag race around the planet, or the relentless demands of an Olympic campaign. The World Sailing Show will be covering every aspect of the racing scene. And 2016 promises to be a particularly big year. The new Extreme Sailing Series fleet takes to hydrofoils for the first time as the series adopts the GC32 Cat. The America's Cup World Series is set to deliver its busiest season as teams prepare for the Cup in 2017. The Sailing World Cup visits three major venues this year before the biggest show of them all, the Olympics. In this month's show, we visit the Sailing World Cup in Melbourne and report on five sibling teams along with the latest in the Paralympic classes. And we head to Malaysia to find out how Olympic aspirations can be a family affair. In addition, we meet the new head of World Sailing to find out what makes him tick as well as taking a glimpse of the future from a different angle as we visit the Youth World Championships. But first, we take a look at an impressive lap of the planet that delivered three new world records, the world's biggest multi-hull, Spindrift 2. Forty-seven days after crossing the start line, Spindrift 2 completed her 29,000-mile blast around the world. The giant 130-foot trimaran and a 13 crew had broken three world records. But they'd failed to get the one they really wanted, the ultimate record, the Jules Verne trophy for the fastest non-stop circumnavigation. Blocked by a windless zone on the final stretch home, the team were forced to accept defeat. It was an emotional homecoming. It's just overwhelming. You know, I, I didn't expect that we were going to be moving so many people and being able to share this experience with so many kids uh, from schools. And uh, I feel very fortunate and privileged. And, uh, and the love which has been showering us uh, since now a couple of hours is just, uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's overwhelming. Their record-breaking attempt had started at a scorching pace. Four days, 21 hours and 29 minutes after crossing the start line off Brittany, they'd reached the equator, clocking an average speed of 30.33 knots. Yet despite this early burst of pace, a struggle through the South Atlantic had eaten into their lead. And there were more speed bumps in store in the Southern Ocean, as the weather refused to play ball. Hitching a ride on a weather system eventually saw Spindrift recover lost miles as she got back into the hunt to break a second record. From Ushant to Tasmania, the beginning of the Pacific Ocean, in 20 days, 4 hours and 37 minutes. We're happy so far. Uh, we're within the times of the record. That was our objective when we left. So now it's a new start. Uh, we're entering into the Pacific. And so let's hope that when we get to the Cape Horn, we'll be ahead. By the time they'd reached Cape Horn, they'd not only made up time, but had set a third record in the process. This time, Ushant to Cape Horn in 30 days, 4 hours and 7 minutes. Now they were 18 hours and 11 minutes ahead of the record pace. The high moment, I think, it was at Cape Horn. Um, you know, we, we, we all know about it and we know it can be very hostile. And we arrived there and it was just magical. Just seeing the tips of the mountains with the snow, the albatross, everything was pink. It was very emotional. Even the guys which went around the world a few times uh, almost were crying, you know. They had never seen the Cape Horn so close. Amazing. But the trip north threw more obstacles in their path. Damage to the mast forced them to slow down and light weather blocked their direct path home. With just two days to go, and with 2,600 miles left, it was clear to the crew that the Jules Verne trophy was out of reach. This time. The irony of the trip is that the team was chasing a record set by the same boat known as Bonk Populaire 5. In preparation for this trip, 
the Spindrift team had made some major modifications to the boat, including reducing the size of the mast and sail. So were there any changes that the team would make for another attempt? No, not really. I think the boat is, uh, is optimised and uh, uh, we know it's good enough, so uh, it's just a question of weather forecast. In just under seven weeks, Spindrift had clocked up more than three times the typical annual mileage of many car drivers. Spindrift's circumnavigation was an extraordinary trip, the second fastest boat ever around the world. And for the fastest woman around the world, this trip was very special. It's an amazing boat. I'm, you know, we have a relationship you know, with that boat. Me and Jan, we, we fell in love with, with this machine. We thought that we still could uh, give that boat uh, a life. And it's already a legend and uh, we know we have a fantastic machine. And so just helming it, it it's just amazing. But no matter how good the boat feels, for this team, second is not good enough. Check in next month when we ask what the future holds and whether Spindrift will be taking on the world once again. Punishing conditions forced the retirement of 31 boats from this year's Rolex Sydney Hobart race. The 100-foot Super Maxi Wild Oats was amongst them. Aiming for her ninth consecutive line honours victory, a torn mainsail forced her crew to retire after the first night. Instead, it was the 100-footer Comanche, skippered by Ken Reed, that was first across the line in Hobart. Paul Clitheroe's TP52 balance took overall victory on handicap. Two weeks later, and Wild Oats was dealt a devastating blow when her well-known and charismatic owner, Bob Oatley, passed away after an illness. It's record time. Two transatlantic records were broken recently. Lloyd Thornburg's 70-foot trimaran Fado set a new course record of 5 days, 22 hours, 46 minutes and 3 seconds for the 3,500-mile race organised by the Royal Ocean Racing Club. And Team Brunel's Volvo 65 shaved 7 hours off the course record for the arc. Meanwhile, on a much shorter course of just 500 metres, Karen Jaggi set a new women's windsurfer speed record of 46.31 knots in Luderitz, Namibia. The Extreme Sailing Series is due to take flight this season as the event moves to foiling GC32 cats after nine years with the Extreme 40. And while we're talking foiling, the America's Cup World Series has announced three new venues for 2016. Oman in February, New York in May, and Toulon, France in September. Round the world skipper Ian Walker was awarded the prestigious Boats.com YJA Yachtsman of the Year title by members of the Yachting Journalists Association. He became the first British skipper to win the Volvo Ocean Race when he led Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing to victory last year. Eleanor Poole was named Young Sailor of the Year, while yachting cartoonist Mike Payton was presented with a Lifetime Achievement Award. Skiffs, cats and boards made up three of the five classes at the Youth Worlds in Langkawi, where 425 young sailors from 76 nations provided a snapshot of the future. There was crash and burn aplenty as the event kicked off with a solid 20 knots across the course. And while the standard of sailing was high, not everybody was finding the going easy. Among those that relished the conditions from the off was Hungary's Maria Erdi, who took the girls' laser radial fleet by storm, as did Australia's Alistair Young in the boys' class. Both secured gold with ease. And they weren't alone. French sailors Louis Flamand and Charles Dorange dominated their racing in the SL16 cat class with a string of wins. Fellow countryman Titouan Le Bosque delivered a similarly impressive performance in the boys' RSX fleet while Russia's Stefania Elfutina took gold in the girls. The pattern continued in the boys 420 class as American duo Will Logue and Bram Brackman stole the show. But when it came to the girls division, victory came down to just one point as the Polish pair Julia Schmidt and Hannah Zik took gold. In the 29ers, the competition was also tight with racing going down to the wire. 
Slovenians Peter Lin Janacek and Anzi Podlogar took gold in the boys, while Siri Kronloff and Vera Hokar took the top slot in the girls' class. And while the event delivered plenty of names to watch, the sailors themselves had an eye on the future too. We would like to try the selection for Team France. It's a project for the US America's Cup, and uh, it's, uh, it's our dream to sail uh, in uh, AC, uh, AC 45, so big uh, multi hull on foot. <laughs> but even for those with a medal around their necks, there was a longer term view. Plans are to move into the laser standard and um, see how that goes, and yeah, the big end goal is the Olympic Games gold medal. Coming up after the break, we find out how a large Malaysian family has medals on their minds. We take a look at two family affairs at the Sailing World Cup in Melbourne. Plus, who is the new man in charge of world sailing and what makes him tick? But first, a major global record was broken eight years ago and stands to this day. What was the record and who set it? Welcome back to the World Sailing Show. We asked what major record was broken eight years ago and by who? The answer, Francis Joyon beat Dame Ella MacArthur's record for the fastest solo global circumnavigation by 14 days to complete the trip in 57 days. This year, Joyon completed a fully crewed circumnavigation aboard IDEC Sport and took 47 days and 14 hours. Setting your sights on a place at the Olympics in 2020 is to set a big goal. My name is Karen Hana Binti Muhammad Effendi. I live in Langkawi, Malaysia and I sell International 420. For Karen, such ambition feels perfectly natural, especially within a sailing mad family of nine brothers and sisters. I sailed when I was nine. I started sailing because most of my brothers are, and sisters are a sailor also. It's really enjoying and sometimes it, it can help you release your stress and sometimes it just enjoy the nature as well. My sailing hero is my brother because uh, he qualified for the Olympic at a young age and I feel so happy for him and I just want to be like him. But off the water, and at home, there's an even greater incentive. Um, this is my house, this is where I live. This is the lounge. That, that's my sister and my brother and my father. Here are some medals, some of my brothers and sisters and also me. Some of them are also my dad. This one is the medal that I win for like, it's a big tournament for the Malaysian. This is uh, what uh, given by the king to her yeah. because he contributes many things to the country and this is what uh, is, uh, is get. Uh, when I'm not sailing, I just like to play with my little brother because he just started walking so I can play tag with him or just uh, messing around with him. Here's the dining room. And let's go to the kitchen. Here's the kitchen. And this is my mom. <laughs> She's cooking. My dad feels really happy and grateful for all of <laughs> his children for selling. And also, uh, he's kind of happy when we see us winning. Yeah, as a father, I'm really very really proud. They're born to be a seller. You know, I don't force them. By nature, they come, they come with a brother or sister, they just join sailing. And as you know, my son, Kairu Nizam, is in the last London Olympic, now preparing for the Rio. Another daughter is on the laser radio, also preparing for the Olympic in Rio. And uh, the elder daughter is in the 470, also in the national program. And I have Kairun Hana, is in the 420, helming. And I also have uh, the next one already, the 12 years old, 
uh, Sharifa Alia is, is still in, uh, in the national team in Optimism. And maybe two young brothers is only uh, three years and uh, one years old. You can see in the future they will be a good seller also. My family, they support me. And my brothers and sisters give me a lot of advice on sharing. Yeah, and most of the time we just feel so happy when we are selling. My ultimate dream is to qualify for the Olympics and win medals for my country. My sister and I shared the same dream to compete in the Tokyo Olympics. So we were planning on selling the 470 together. This kind of words make me very happy and uh, it makes me very proud as a father. It's, it's really happy to know that my dad is proud of me. It will be great to represent Malaysia for the youth world and it will be honoured because most of my brothers and sisters already went to the youth world, so now it's me. Combine the intense heat generated inland during the summer with the cool southern ocean, and it's easy to see why Melbourne has a reputation for volatile weather and a challenging race course. Melbourne played host to 900 competitors in the first Sailing World Cup event of the 2016 season. This was an important regatta for any team with a focus on the Olympic rings. But there were also some personal battles and pairings. Take the Gilmore family, three brothers racing against each other in the 49er class. I'm David and this is Sam and Lockie and we're sailing here in the 49er class at South Melbourne. The first time we've all sailed against each other. It was sort of something that we were introduced to quite early. As we got older we just sort of, well I, I started to enjoy it more and more. I enjoy the competitions, travelling all year round and competing. For me I'm a pretty competitive person and when I got finally got into racing it I really enjoyed it and just enjoyed, I suppose, the feeling of winning at first and when you get in the front of the fleet, it's a great feeling. I love the competitive nature. I've been to a couple of international events and it's just really, really enjoyable there. Three battles but one goal to win and there's no love lost afloat. There's a close cross, there's shouting, it's all on. <laughs> oh yeah, there's definitely yelling at the time but usually you give each other a little bit of a leeway, fortunately. By the end of the week, all three had made it into the top ten and onto the medal race. With no family instructions, it was elder brother David and his crew, Rhys Mara, who took the bronze. Meanwhile, in the 470 class, there was a double take aboard one boat. I'm Alexander Conway. I'm Patrick Conway. We're twins from Sydney sailing the 470 class. They might look the same, but they don't always agree. The law would be arguments based on a matter of how quickly you get past it and you just go, no, you're going to disagree on some things and say, I won't go left here, I won't go right. So we'll have to go one way. Whether being twins was the key or not, their results showed perfect symmetry with a flawless set of nine wins to take the gold. Yeah, well done, boys. Melbourne had also played host to the Para World Sailing Championships the week before. For some, the Sailing World Cup was now the last opportunity to qualify for the Paralympic Games in Rio in September. The pressure was on. For others who'd already qualified, the event was another opportunity to focus on high-quality Olympic-style racing. Dan Fitzgibbon and Liesel Tesh in the Scud 18 class had successfully defended their world title to take gold, but this was about more than just winning. It's just really exciting here to be in a fleet again. So as Aussies, we're so isolated. So to get into a big fleet racing again and put the tactical stuff onto the, into the equations, something we really enjoy doing. Hot on their heels was the British pair, Alexandra Rickham and Nikki Birrell, who were clear on what their objectives now needed to be. We came here to win and uh, we didn't. And um, so yeah, so you know, just telling us that we need to probably do a bit more because we need to get past the Aussies. Meanwhile, Damien Seguin continued his winning streak, taking gold after winning the 2.4 metre World Championships just a week before. It's a great day for me to win here. It's the last race of the year for me. And uh, I won last week the World Championship and to won the World Cup. Uh, it's just amazing. 
I love Australia. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the sonar, Australians Colin Harrison, Jonathan Harris and Russell Bowden made up for their disappointment of silver at the Para Worlds to take gold at the Sailing World Cup. <laughs> 2016 is a big year for the world governing body, which kicked off with a new name and a brand new CEO. Andy Hunt comes from a strong Olympic background. After the launch at the London Boat Show, we went to find out more about the man at the top and his thoughts on his new role. Integrity is a massive thing for me. Transparency, you know, I want to see world sailing actually seen as a real um, example of best practice amongst the international federations of sport. So, you know, I think there are a number of things that we, we, can, uh, uh, we can do together. But number one is, of course, you know, the, the, the importance of the safety and environment for sailors is absolutely critical. You know, fairness, integrity, that's absolutely at the heart of, heart of the role of the organisation to make sure that we've got uh, rules, regulations, process, training, development to ensure that that can uh, take place. I, I would call sailing my sport because probably around seven or eight years old in the early 70s, um, I took up sailing, dinghy sailing, or sailing uh, enterprises. Actually, it probably wasn't until I was in my in my kind of late 30s, 40s, that I really got into sailing once again, but into yacht racing. And uh, I had the chance to do the uh, Round Britain Island race uh, with with Challenge, the um, with Shave Lives Challenge, and then that was it. Really, I bought a bought a yacht, and away I went. Well, I think there's a great team at uh, World Sailing, but you know, I think there's a real opportunity for us as a sport to, uh, to kind of move, to, to move on, to, to increase our profile, to increase the interest in the sport. You know, it's, it's a fantastic sport for life. Next month, the Sailing World Cup in Miami is the first opportunity for teams to square up against those that they'll meet at the games. We'll be there. After Spindrift's unsuccessful attempt at lifting the Jules Verne trophy, what's next for the monster multi-hull? And will they have another go? And the Extreme Sailing Series takes off as teams prepare for a season on foils. <laughs>